morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Sir Meerkat, and welcome back to the Moto Meerkat channel, and welcome to another episode of the Chatterbox podcast. Now, in last week's episode, I spoke to a fine Italian gentleman named Riccardo Ponzio, who talked us through exactly what it's like to race a Jaguar R3 Formula One car. And I'm sure you were just as jealous as I was about his V10 screaming engine in the back of his car. I wish I could drive that as well, but sadly, might never get the chance. Lucky, lucky Riccardo. But today's episode is going to be just as good. I I'm very much sure of it. As today, I'm speaking with a legend of British motor racing, absolutely amazing that we've got him on the podcast today and I can't wait to speak to him. Uh, I certainly have lots of fond memories of my childhood watching him on the telly and a 30-year veteran of the British Touring Car Championship he is. He won the title back to back in 2005 and 2006 and then won it again in 2011. Please welcome Matt Neal. How are you doing today sir? Hey John, I'm good thanks. Good, good. good. Yeah I'm really really good. I'm really good. How's, uh, how's lockdown been treating you? Uh, the first one I enjoyed very much so because it's probably the, the longest I've spent at my house since I've been an adult. Yeah, um, so the garden got some good needed attention, but since then, really, I've been flat out just um, just trying to uh, make things ha happen. Mm -hmm. You know, the world's a strange place at the minute. One with COVID, but two with um, electrification, which is is having a bigger impact, seems to be having a bigger impact on, on the world, the automotive world, as, as COVID is on you know, the, the population. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 all having big impacts. Did the first lockdown, there's a lot of racing drivers, because they obviously couldn't get out onto the real track, some of them decided to try out some sim racing. Were you able to do any of that, or was that kind of not really your scene? I've got some, I've got, I, I, we've got some sims at Dynamics, um, and um, I got them to step one up. When we knew we were all going to get locked down, I got them to step one up in my garage. And I used nice. that mm -hmm. yeah, it's, um, it's, it's good for learning a new circuit, I think. But the realism, I struggle. It's still a toy. It's still a game for me. You know, yeah. uh, you know I think my boys were into it. Hamish was really into it. He was doing 24-hour races and everything on it. Um, mm -hmm. But I think I struggled to get into it, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 24 hours is maybe a little bit long. Maybe don't do a 24 hour for the first one, at least. Get yourself a bit better in. But yeah, it's the same as my dad says. He just can't get into it. He says it doesn't have the feel of a real car and he just can't quite get up to up to speed with it. But that yeah, fear factor that you're hurt yourself. exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. It doesn't have kind of the bum in the seat. Same feeling. Yeah. 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 But um, yeah, we'll move on from sim racing. We'll actually cast our minds back way back to the start of your career, before even sim racing was really a concept, I, I think. How did you initially get into motorsport in that time? Was it more of a parent-driven thing, kind of stuck you in a car and sent you off, or was it more of a desire from yourself? Because I believe, actually, I said karting there, but I believe you started in motocross, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, I had just cars and bikes. I didn't do proper karting per se, but I did cars and bikes just mm. around the field. And right. just what you bought with some quid, like an old Gilera fifty, with some pedals to start, and the throttle brakes, so we got mold grips, and who could wheel it the longest, and then just old old carts with lawnmower engines, and I got a bit of a bug for it. My dad retired from motorsport when I was at an early age, probably two or three years old. Um, okay. So I can't really remember anything. The, the one memory I've got it with my dad racing is he. He had a big stunt at the Nervo Ring and he got brought back and he got patches over his eyes and he was all bust up. Mm. And um, mm. the, um, he just got dumped on the doorstep by these guys. And my mum brought him upstairs and he was lying on the bed with his bandages over his head and all the rest of it. And I was about two, I think. And that's the only memory I've got of my dad of racing. <laughs> I just stood up in his bed thinking, what could I do for him? But, um, no, I just I got the bug early on, and, and my dad wasn't he was busy with work, so we, we didn't really have time to, to do anything. So I got an older mate who was doing motocross. So as soon as I was seventeen, I got myself a motocross bike and uh, got a trailer, hooked it on the back of the car, and, and went racing and spanned it myself and travelled myself, and yeah, that was, that was where I started. Then. Yeah. No, no, that's cool. Motocross is a good place to kind of get experience, isn't it? Cars. I did motocross for about, I got to the top level of amateur motocross in the UK. Okay. And at the top level, I was, I was brave enough, but I wasn't good enough. 
Right, okay. I the quick boys, I keep crashing. And I started hurting myself a bit. The bravery wasn't the problem. Um, so when I was about 21, my dad got me into a car just to get me away from the bike. Because I was just going to keep racing. Because it was the only thing I could afford to do. Um, and I don't think he thought it would go anywhere. You know, he bought an old Fiesta for the brand. Um, and then he... An old friend of his, Jeff Goodliffe, up in Rochdale, he was running some in the the, the Ford Championship at that point, the Ford Credit Championship. And um, he had a bit of a deal, he could run on the back of him. So then we went, you know, went racing. But, you know, it was sort of, sort of fell into it. Yeah. How did you find that change from motocross into car racing? Was it quite a simple transition or was it quite difficult going from two wheels to four? Um. It's like, well, I think it's when Carter's moved up, it's, it's such a heavy thing. You know, with a bike, you're part of the bike and you can really throw it around and you have such a big influence. Then you've got so much inertia with a car. Um, that's what you've been used to. And, and probably in, with, um, with Metacross, you know, your input is very aggressive, very aggressive sport. When, especially with one make racing, you well into it, it's, it's an effort. Trying to eat that last, you know, find that last couple of tenths of a second, and it's, it's just the next thing. So it's good to be used to, you know. Yeah, yeah, a very different, a very different thing. But yeah, you managed to transfer over into the four wheels. And can you give us kind of a snapshot? Talk us through your motorsport experience prior to eventually joining British Touring Cars. And why did you decide not to pursue a single-seater career? Was it simply due to the fact of your height, obviously you being six foot six, I believe, or were there other re- other reasons as why you didn't follow that uh, that kind of trajectory? Um, I mean, I love Formula One. I, I mean, I remember going to the British Grand Prix and my dad used to get us in. You know, we'd sneak in the bridge of the car, so we didn't have to pay. And, and Silverstone was all proud field. And the Grand Prix at Brands Hatch. So um, I loved it, but I, I never really aspired to it. I think it's because it was going to be unachievable. Well, I never thought I'd do motorsport as I did. I never thought I'd get the touring car, but Formula One was definitely out of reach. And my height would have stopped it anyway. Um, so touring, touring cars was not my goal. It was it was my passion, really. Uh, I, I, you know, but I, you get kids now and they go, right, I'm going to end up in British touring cars, I'm going to end up in world touring cars, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. From an early age, I never had that. All I did was, I remember when um, when I was 17, our, our idol of a car was a Renault 5 Turbo, because it was one make championship for those. And we, we um, because it was before the internet, and so we found out they were racing it, it was around at, um, at Donington Park. So me and my mate drove up there, and paid away in, and we were falling all over these Renault cars. I think one day I could just drive one of those things. It, you know, all my Christmas Eve come together. Touring cars was on that day at Donington, and we watched it, and it was great. But it was never going to. We never get there. Um, and so we watched the touring car race, and then went back to falling over these Renault cars. So one day I could just drive one of those. So it's, it's a little bit surreal that I've ended up there and winning races and winning even winning a championship. So. Yeah, but that's amazing. I, I, with the one meg racing where it was, I just wanted to enjoy the moment. I wanted to be as successful as I could and win. I was very, I'm very, I'm a very competitive person, but I just wanted to enjoy the moment. And, and I we sort of worked year on year because you know it was hard with the sponsorship then. My dad's company had a real company, and that went bust on my 18th birthday. Oh, so um, we were building it up. You know, in, in early days, there was only 10 or 11 of us. Um, so. What we did is we used a bit of a business model to raise sponsorship. We were going to our suppliers for whether to supply the boxes or the aluminium or even we even got the gas board on. And as the company grew, we managed to sort of extract a little bit more sponsorship out of um, the suppliers uh, and friends and colleagues. And that allowed us to progress through the ranks from one make championship to group and production saloons and then finally into the ranks. So yeah, just before you got to kind of British Touring Cars or in that kind of same time frame, during the 90s, you also competed at the Bathurst 1000. You finished second in 1998. What was that like as an experience? And how did you find the Mount Panorama circuit? Because it's certainly a beautiful one. Um, 
yeah, the TV doesn't do it justice of what it's like um, to drive. It is steep. You know, it's called the mountain for a reason. Um, and the fans were, were pretty, pretty feral back then as well. Um, I've done there in, in 97 because um, we've been racing uh, Nissan uh, over here. And Nissan Motorsport Europe, they sort of, they had a test driver, a Kiwi called Stevie Richards, son of the great Jim Richards out there. And he'd been a test driver for Nissan. And as a bit of a reward to, um, to Steve and to me, they sent me out with Steve to, to run in there car run by Gary Rogers Motorsport out there, but the funding wasn't brilliant and the car wasn't brilliant and um, in 97 we didn't finish, the car broke, uh, it was a midfield car at best, um, but then 98 came along and there was a big interest from all the manufacturers, they were, they had Volvo, the GM, which is a big box called Holden, um, Peugeot, Honda, um, like Audi, BMW, they all suddenly they wanted to go to this way. This was going to be a big showdown. And um, Nissan was a, was a really good car at that point, but either Nissan factory weren't interested in going or there wasn't a budget there. And so there was, a, there was an old Victor car at NMA at Nissan Motorsport Europe in Victor. And they said to uh, Dynamic, who was running me, they went, well, do you want to put a, put, put a program together and see if we can send this, this, this spare car down there and do it? And, you know, they went, it was, it was sort of sorted out. We went down there, but we never thought we'd do any good. It was just a bit of a couple of applications, you know, a road trip for everybody. Um, because, you know, the Bathurst is a thousand kilometers race. The longest uh, a missing engine had ever lasted before that stood 300 and 600 K. So we weren't going to finish. Um, anyway, we got this car in a container that was in bits, and so they built it out of. They got one and a half cars actually, and they built it the week before at Bathurst in the old garages. And I remember the boss of Nissan Motorsport Europe, Alex Paul, he turned up and he said to Steve and me, he said, Look, lads, he said, if you could just qualify near the front and you know, you can have a good run, and, you know, it'd be brilliant. Anyway, we qualified on the front row with, with um, Rydell and uh, Steve's dad, Jim Richards, which is mega with a big factory Volvo thing, and they were big, doing a big push down there. This guy came up to us, he said, oh, if you could just run at the front for a wee bit, you know, like the first hour, the seven hour race. He said, that would be great, all our expectations. Um, and we did, and we were leading, leading the race. Um, and then we sort of moved the goalpost each time. And um, anyway, we finished by, uh, we finished second by 1.5 seconds, I think. The person finished about first to that point, but it's, it's um, it was, I, I always say, out of all my titles and you know my big, big win in '99, that was my my best race because we overachieved. You know, you don't always have to win. I think to, to do your best achievements and, and what we achieved, that, and we took risks. You know, with, with the fueling, the pit stop strategy, and I actually ran out of fuel 100 meters after the finish line of the seven-hour race, um, and uh, that actually pushed back to Park Furman by John Cunningham in, in the holding corner. Um, wow. So that's that's one of my best best races ever, I think. Yeah, wow, that really sounds it to finish only uh, one and a half seconds off the leader at the end of a one thousand kilometer race, and to have the the fuel perfectly calculated like that, amazing. Yeah, it reminds me of when I spoke to um, Alexander Rossi, and they were saying how he was having to save fuel and things, and he coasted across the line to win the Indy Five Hundred. So yeah, similar similar way, pushing the boundaries and yeah, getting those amazing results through uh, just incredible calculations and incredible driving. So. Yeah, an amazing achievement from you there at such an incredible track as Bathurst. So just wow. But yeah, moving it back to, to the UK, what made you, obviously you have said how you didn't decide to go down single seaters. Formula One Formula One wasn't really an option. And then you did have other choices as well. But what made you end up going the route of getting to the British Touring Car Championship? Because I knew that you, you did switch at one point. You switched to the European Touring Cars for 2001, but only stayed for one season and returned then to B, BTCC again. What meant that you couldn't stay away? Why was the BTCC so attractive to you? Um, I think at the end of Super Touring, the, the regulations changed um, in, in Britain because they just got out of hand. They got too expensive. Yeah. Um, and I signed a deal with Persia to do the new BTC rig, which is uh, lasting for a few years. Anyway, they ran into financial 
after we signed, it was me, Steve Sloper, and Danny Eve, the three part team. I was the last to sign. And then Peugeot fought around financial difficulties, and they literally they used it uh, last one in, first one out, as soon as I was the last one to sign. So we did the first race, and that was it. I was out. But Dynamics still had some, still had the, the hardware of the Nissan from the year before. Um, the European Championship was still running to two to, to Super Touring Regs. It was the last, you know, it was always a year behind Britain. Um, we still had some sponsorship in place. Um, so we said, right, we're going to do that. And that, it was as simple as that. Uh, and I sort of dovetailed that without going down to Australia and doing some V8 stuff with the Holdings. Um, mm. It was good. I made some great friends out there. It was, it was, it was a refreshing change going from, um, you know, the UK tracks, which you know, like the back of your hand, to yeah. doing some different stuff where you haven't been before. You know, Harama and Nürburgring and Perth and Zolder. They were very, you know, classic tracks. Um, so we did that, but then Super Touring finished at the end of that year in ETC. So, and I got a little bit of a phone call out of the blue uh, for me and Harrison, the boss of uh, Vauxhall, uh, Triple H, saying, did I want to come back and drive for them? Uh, in the egg, egg, egg asteroids and so it was a bit of a lifeline for me because I thought when that year was, was done I thought that's it it's one of, you know, I probably got half a dozen points in my career when I thought it's all over uh, and that was one of them until we found, literally a phone call out of the blue. Wow that's crazy yeah so so early on that you thought that it could possibly be all over but yeah obviously you got that lifeline and was able to come back into into BTCC what would you say was the biggest difference at that time, anyway, between a European Championship and a British Championship, in terms of just like the whole vibe of it and like the racing style, was the UK one a bit more, um, what would be the word, um, a bit more elbows out kind of racing? And was the European maybe a little bit no, more I, respectful? Say, or? Um, the big difference was, it made, uh, we all moan about the UK, and I'm, I'm the first one to, but it made me appreciate the UK, the, the regulations and the and mm-hmm. fairness. You might not get on with your kisses all the time, but they're literally they're, they're as difficult for everybody. When <laughs> they, you hear them in Formula One go, well, Ferrari get away with that because they're Ferrari. And you know, you've got Italians or French making the decision. And they are so blatant to you. And you're going, that's not right. That's not correct. And at that point, it was Alfa Romeo, which is sort of Ferrari. Alfa Romeo is the, is the touring car version of Ferrari is the Formula One. They could just be walked on water and their drivers, their Italian drivers. Uh, Fabrizio Giovinardi, Nicola Rene, um, you know, so on and so forth. And I had a few run-ins with them just because I stand my ground. And, um, you know, for Fabrizio, I ended up having a proper fallout with over there. And then I n- I'd never thought that, um, um, you know, a few years later, he's one of my best friends. I spoke to him literally last week. Um, yeah, and we've been mates 10 years further down the road. Oh, wow, some great experiences, and as you said earlier, to go to some of those amazing tracks is um, a great experience. And just being able to drive around those is amazing. Hopefully, I can do the same at some point in the future. Maybe not in quite so amazing cars, though. Might just have to be in my Volkswagen up. But yeah, <laughs> so I'll jump kind of slightly forward in your career now to 2005, where you were able to fend off so many famous names to take your first BTCC title. Some of those people being Ivan Muller, Jason Plato, Tom Chilton, even more people than that. And it's definitely a period for me that's very, very nostalgic. Obviously, you won it driving the beautiful Team Halfords branded Honda Integra Type Rs. Can you talk us through what that whole season was like for you in 2005 and the feeling when you crossed the line and realised that you'd won the championship? Um, yeah, it's, my dad had pushed us into the Integra, said we should go this route, and I was a bit anti it um, okay. because of its aerodynamic, and they built, we built a very strong car. Uh, it was a nightmare to start with, like a lot of good cars are. And we arrived at the first place, and it was still a real handful. Um, but I think the, the Astra, that, um, which was the main opposition with Muller, was a hand for him as well. And we managed to nick a win at the first one. And then it was just, the car was strong because the racing was rough that year, for two years. Uh, and the one thing, it was it was built by Sherman's Agra Integra. So it would take the hits and you, you'd carry on. It was a good engine, good Neil Brown engine. Um, just a perfect package. 
Um, it's a shame they changed the regs, which sort of outlawed it, which um, was a bit of a shame. But uh, yeah, at, at the end, it's it's a bit surreal. I mean, I've had others speak to me, and I've you know, the, winning a championship the day afterwards, it's almost the biggest one of the biggest anti climaxes because you sacrifice so much yeah. and <clears throat> you fall out with so many people to get there, and yeah, you're fighting all the way. And then when I did it, it's like when I won my first race. The next day, you wake up and you go. Well, am I a better person? No, I'm not. You know, I'm the same person that got out of bed yesterday morning. And then you go, well, what have I done this for? And I remember speaking to Colin Turkin after his first or second title. And he goes, oh, it's all right for you. You're on the UK mainland. He says, I'm stuck out in Northern Ireland and no one cares out here. So I get real depression. I went, no, Colin, it's nothing different. And Flash was the same. You know, and you almost need a bit of a pep talk of, it's your, I remember Carl Fogarty saying that he never enjoyed any of his racing at all until he retired. Because every race you win, you're worried about the next race. That's history. Every championship you win. And I can remember waking up in the day after it was either five or six. The very next day, I'm, I'm focused on the next year and how we're going to do it again the next year. And so the pressure of the next year. So you don't. I wouldn't say you enjoy the moment even. You enjoy the, I'd say you enjoy the adrenaline rush and the buzz. Or you not enjoy it, you thrive off it. You feed off it. But um, there's always the pressure of next year, next race, what, what you're going to do and what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all a bit more, especially in motor race terms anyway, it's more about the chase of getting to that win. Once you actually get there, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of, oh, well, this is it. Oh, I've got a trophy and I can say, yes, I've done it. But yeah, it's all about those battles leading to it. And yeah, the the run through it but yeah you still did an absolutely incredible job to win the championship that year and then you came back the following year in 2006 and you did it again which must have been even more incredible it was a little bit closer uh, on points wise in 2006 anyway with Jason Plato only about 40 points off of your tally of 289 and speaking of the devil I think I do have to address it the incredible rivalry between yourself and Jason Plato you seem to always have disagreements both on and off the track on on occasion and the most memorable moment for me anyway would be between the two of you at uh, a qualifying at Rockingham 2011 the year where you would actually win the third uh, of your championships where you told J you told Jason uh, and I'll, I'll beat this in the edit I'll rip your fucking face off which is just an absolutely classic line, a brilliant line for, from you there. <laughs> what makes the clip so funny for me is Jason's dad saying, for God's sake, tell him to stop to your dad, which was just so funny. Can you give us a little more insight into that whole debacle between you and Jason, that specific moment, but also just your whole career with him? As I believe off, off that one, you got some fines and a couple of points on your license, didn't you? Yeah, we. They probably, normally you go to the clerk of the course and... You know, if you if you appeal the clerk of the course, you you get your fines or your points there. Yes. You know, if you have a, if you get points on your race license, the same as a road license, and you can lose it. Gotcha. Same way. If you appeal the clerk of the course, you then go to the stewards. Now, if you go to the stewards, it's starting to get heavy. They're all barristers and judges, and yeah. it's starting to get expensive. <laughs> that was yeah. one of the few times yeah. I've been frog marched straight to the the stewards' office, and they're. they're they're standing, you know, they're sitting us down and going, you're a disgrace, you're a disgrace, you know, people are looking up to you and you're, you know, this and that and the other. And right, you can have 5,000 pounds for and you can have 5,000. And then, you know, we walk out and literally 100 metres away, you've got the ITV blokes going, lads, that was brilliant. Can you do it again tomorrow, like for the race day? And we're going, well, hang on a minute. There's a little bit of mixed messages here. Um, but Jason, I got on with him, you know, before, in super turn days but I, I, mean, I used to think it was personal against me but it's not it's just the way jason goes about his business he's just if you're a threat to him he attacks and the way he, the way he attacks he gets very personal he gets under your skin you know he'll be phoning you up in the middle of the night just kind of rapping you and, um and i'm i taught my kids if someone comes at you if someone hits you you hit them back harder and um, that i know it's wrong but it's what I've always believed in. That's what my parents say to me as well. So, <laughs> Great people learn. And it's not always the right, you know, sometimes I had to recognise and I had to turn the other cheek, which is hard. And, you know, and say, you know, sit. So I just had to ignore it and get on with it. And that was so against my 
normal instinct. Um, but it's probably the thing to do. Um, but he, he did get in the muscle again, and in 11, he got under my. He'd been getting, he'd been chipping away at me for months. That was sort of the, the crescendo at Rockingham. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sort of bubbled out, and he knew. He, I, I, the problem was, I could see him keep coming. I knew what he was doing, but I couldn't stop him. Um, and yeah, so, yeah so, you know, we're talking now, anyway. Yeah, <laughs> well, there, as you say, yeah, the rest, the rest is kind of history on that one. What exactly happened in qualifying? Was it just you were like battling for track position and hitting each other a few times? What happened in the qualifying now, session? What he did is he, he, managed, he stepped on pole and we were fast. He knew the hundred right. were fast, mm-hmm. and we had one tire run left, which he didn't. He'd gone early. Um, uh-huh. Track was going quicker. So what he did is he knew he saw when we were going out, um, and he had um, pit lane. Um, Know, you know, priority. So he got out just before us uh, and let us do our warm up lap. And you've got pretty much you get one lap on your tyres. He waited just to the critical, critical point of the track and just slowed on the apex. Just fucked our lap. And that annoyed me. <laughs> so then he came in and then he gives me the bird and, and the bank sign. And that was sort of that sort of lip and lip. That's, that's a fair reaction. Jason is one of the few times I've, I've actually pleaded for them to put points on my license. Because I remember one, one point we were racing at Snetterton, and we were first to Snetterton, and um, he was, my car was faster, and uh, it was the, the Civic days. And um, I remember he would he'd keep brake checking me around Corum, really slowing the car up. And on about the fifth lap, he really brake checked me, really slowed the car up, and I just nudged into the back of him because he, he did it more than he had done on the previous lap. And I sort of picked his back end out wide, which is really gentle, but caught him. I thought, stop it, I'll just go through. You know, I'm fast enough anyway. So the very next corner, he stands in the back of me in retaliation and puts me off. I go down to sixth place. Anyway, then they put a protest in. What they're going to do me the initial contact so i get frog marched up to the clerk of course office and they said right um uh right you're you're going to uh, we're going to do you so three points on your license you're allowed a maximum of 12 uh yeah. you know, this misdemeanor and everything fine but that year we had a points tally system and we all knew they wouldn't they wouldn't publicize it but we all knew because the points would stay on your license for, for 12 months and we all knew Jason was on nine points. So I went, okay, give me the points. But you've always told us retaliation is better, is worse than the event itself. So if you give me three points, you've got to give him three points for retaliating. So give it to me, give me the points, please. And then you've got to give it to him. Because I'm knowing he was going to get banned. Then they go, all right, out the office. Uh, and they're deliberating for about 10 minutes. Call us back in. They said, right, you two, you need to take hands and make up and stop being silly. I'm going, no, no, give me the points. I want the points. And um, anyway, it's another one he got away with. Yeah, what a lucky, lucky chap getting away with that one as well. I guess they kind of didn't want the that stigma of yeah, having a banned driver on the grid. So you kind of had to grit your teeth and, and bear that one. But since that, obviously, we moved relatively past that. You guys have been able to put these disagreements behind you both. And you're, you're relatively good friends, aren't you? Now, I think I saw you guys on the late um, the late break show together so uh, you guys are in like relatively good stead with each other aren't you yeah i don't know if it's because we're older or or what or we haven't been fighting but jason's horns come out when he's like he, he can sniff a championship um and probably neither of us have been in line for the championship for the last two three years but we've been racing you know he's actually now one of the guys i i, I, I trust racing alongside him until we can until we come to have a go for a championship then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I'll be back to square one with you guys again. Back to all the fighting, and <laughs> we would quite like to see that. But yeah, maybe with age, probably best to yeah move on, move on from that now. But yeah, since all that's kind of happened, you've continued to race in in British touring cars. You've also done a lots a lots of other stuff alongside it. I did see that you'd won the Jerry Marshall Trophy at the Goodwood Members Meeting in 2015. What's it been like driving all these other cars? Because I assume. Um, a lot of people have wanted to invite you to be guest drivers and things. What would you say are kind of the most fun things that you've been able to drive during your career? The, um, 
Well, historic, you know, historic racing is, is big. It's, it's a multi-billion euro business. In Europe. Yeah. Um, um, I never really got it. I always wanted technology. I wanted the next gen, you know, the next invention. And I was, you know, we used to go to the festival to see uh, the Honda. And some people would yes. say to me, if you could drive any car here, what would it be? And I go, the one I come in, you know, but I just like, I really appreciate what we're doing in the BBC and that's what I'm, that's what my bag is. And anyway, I'm a, and I never ever got historic racing. And then someone invites me down to Goodwood Revival. And I'm like, all right, okay, I'll just speed up with them. So I went down there, walked through the gates, looked. I went, I know I get it. I know I get it. Because the, the revival, if someone's never been there, they need to go. Because you are just immersed in this world. So I thought, I'm not doing dress stuff, I'm not doing, you know, everyone's in contemporary clothing and all that. And I went, no, it's unbelievable. It's like going to, the way I describe it, it's like going to Disneyland, the pet flag. And um, the cars are pretty larry. You know, the safety standards aren't what they are now. Uh, the speeds are, you know, they can get, you know, I think my first race was in a list of them on Sunbeam Tiger. Right. Which is blisteringly fast, mm. blisteringly fast, and it would go anyway except in a straight line. And we're doing, you're doing yeah. about 150 mile an hour down the back straight into Woodcut. And I, the first time I tested it, it was in Banff, and this thing was all over the shop. I remember driving down the straight thinking, oh my god, what am I, what am I, what am I doing here? And then I looked across because there's an airstrip inside the, the circuit, and the strip was coming into land next to me, and I thought, that's what I'm doing here, that's pretty cool, isn't it? So, um, but yeah, it's it's. You get, I think touring car drivers initially got a, when I first started driving there, because I was one of the first kids to do it, and you got a real bad rap, like you were a thug, um, a lower talent kid thug. You know, in, in their eyes, the Formula One drivers are the elite, then sports car drivers, um, and touring car drivers. You were looked on as less talented and um, a bit of a brute, big damage cars. Mm-hmm. When in fact, it's the touring car drivers who've gone there now and we've dominated. Um, not just me, loads of others. And we've had a real good run. And um, I think we look after the cars better than most because we're used to cars moving around and, and not behaving as they should do. When someone from from formula driving or sports car driving, they're, they're used to the cars being nailed to the floor. Uh, not moving around. <coughs> Dario Franchitti, when he went from from IndyCar to, to NASCAR, and as you said, he just couldn't get his head around it. Just the mm-hmm. amount of cars going around. Um, yeah. But uh, I think he's doing pretty good in the spot right now. Yeah, yeah, I think he's doing all right. But, yeah, as you say, it's like completely different you know, style of racing between those two. But yeah, I feel like British touring car drivers kind of have that raw and rugged thing with a car that's very different to, as you say, the Formula cars are very hunkered down with the with the aero and things, whereas touring cars are a very different, very different style of driving that you can kind of move over to different well, like, styles I, of cars. I remember, I remember saying, in, uh, just to say, it's almost a class thing down there. You look at it, you look at it, they look at touring car drivers, I think, as working class. Mm. And you are a bit, um, even though there's some quite affluent people in it. Um, and I remember yeah. being in a driver's group thing many years ago, and, and some, one driver's coming in, he's new to the championship. I remember being crossed through wherever I was fighting, I don't know, these two cops, they ain't gonna lie. Just because you have literally got to, you've got to be prepared to roll your sleeves up a bit. And it is a bit, it is a bit um, brutal the way mm-hmm. Yeah, no, no, certainly. Yeah. My, um, yeah, I mentioned them before because my main influence for racing through my life was was my father and he's always said he'd like if he ever won the lottery it would be british touring cars that he would go and do but um it was your statement about going out in silverstone in the wet in uh i think you said it was a it was a lister i'm not sure what you said the specific type was but yeah my that my father's also got a lister jaguar nobly um and i remember your what you said kind of resonated with me, with me a bit there because i remember i think one of his first two or three races was in the wet at silverstone in that car and he looked pretty sheepish before he was going out in that and i think uh yeah it was quite the learning curve for him out in the wet in a car like that with so much power and so little grip but um yeah but it seems very exciting and i'm glad you've got more into racing of these older cars because yeah people seem to really, really enjoy them and i've certainly have been going to events like I'll Bonington Classics. i'll be back at revival again this year 
Awesome. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, hopefully I get to go that. And if I do, definitely come and yeah, give your little uh, little thing a watch. That'd be classic, mate. That'd be awesome. But um, yeah, looking forward, as you say, hopefully doing the revival. What kind of other plans do we have for, for 2021 and even further further forward? As we've been saying, COVID has made stuff a little bit more difficult to, to plan and do. But do you have anything in the works and what are your general thoughts for, for the future? Well, I'm not people said are you retiring? No, I'm not retiring. I'm a victim of circ well, I'm not a victim. It's a circumstance where I'm but I'm not going to be driving a full okay. program this year. Um, my primary thing is gonna be um, helping dynamics. Uh, the hybrid right. uh, testing cars of uh, you know shed and row bottom and trying to help them from behind the scenes. That's going to be my priority. Uh, I've got a couple of little offers to do some historic racing. Uh, I had some offers from other stuff, but I've just got to keep it real. And, and I've been just trying to connect the dots at the moment, commercially, you know, with businesses and members of the car team, even trying to sort that out at the minute, rather than um, looking for new drives. Because I've, I've got some plans to have all of that there. That's cool. Lots of things yeah, going on, but as you say, lots to sort and lots to be doing so yeah i wish you all the best of luck with whatever you decide to do whatever presents itself in 2021 and further afield my friend but that's kind of all the questioning really from from me today however i have still got some questions from fans to ask you if that's all okay Perfect, perfect. So thank you to everyone who sent in their questions. Uh, you can do so if you want to ask a question to any of my future guests, you can check out my Instagram or Twitter, both in the uh, links down below in the description. Go and give me a follow over there and uh, then you'll know when to get involved in future. But yeah, we'll jump into the first question. It's from at Daniel Philpot on Twitter. He asks, how do the BTCC cars of today compare to the BTCC cars of the 90s and 2000s? And how different are they to drive? Um, they are, in one respect, more sophisticated. In another respect, less. They are heavier, a lot heavier. They're about a quarter of a ton heavier. So you've got a lot of inertia that um, the... Um, Super touring cars you take from uh, the 90s were very nervous, very agile. They were quite, they were on narrow rims that have, have wheels and tires were two inches narrower than they are now. So they've got a lot more rubber. And the reason they did that, they reduced, uh, with the new regulations, they reduced our aero, they increased mechanical grip. And the reason for that is so we could run nose to tail more. I mean, you still get um, aero understeer and all, all the rest of it. You get a close behind someone. But in, in Super Touring, that ended up very troubling. So the racing got a little bit boring. Um, mm. The cars were awesome to drive back then. They were so nimble uh, and agile. And on the edge, it made uh, a qualifying lap really special. And we, you know, in the in the mid nineties, we had qualifying tyres, and um, you know, literally these qualifying tyres. They'd last one lap, one lap. But the drift and stuff was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's sort of the controlled tyre and all the rest of it. The cars are much heavier and bigger now, but we've got more horsepower. So what they're achieving now is about the same sort of lap times as they were in, in the heyday of Super Touring. Right. right, okay, gotcha. Yeah, so changing in kind of different different ways there. But yeah, the Super Touring just doesn't really work now, but oh, they are just amazing to, to look at, to listen to incredible cars. I would say I'd like in Super Touring to a 125 motocross bike that you on the pipe, it's buzzing, and you've got to keep it ready. Now, because mm. we've got turbo engines, uh, we've got so much torque. We've probably got double the torque we had back then, even more than that. Um, so a lot of it is down to management of what maps you're running and how you're running it. And you know, you can get wheel spin up to fourth, fifth gear if you're not careful in, in certain conditions. Um, but I like that. It gives you something more to think about. It's not just, you're not just flat out all the time. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, things are changing up a bit more, more things to yeah, sink your teeth into and get used to and get better at. But yeah, on to the second question. At Will B 17 k on Instagram asks, what is your favourite movie ever? Um, or just a, just a general flavour, maybe not one specific one. Uh, what films, born films, 
Blackbird Down, the Forest Jump. I like Forest Jump because it's okay. It, because it, you need to you, you please what you please in life, and you please everything from mm-hmm. American football player to a, a war hero to um, you know, a fishing empire and everything. And it comes down to, and it's again, it's so what it's about enjoying life and yeah. being content with life and all the rest of it. And I think it's, it's got a yeah, the sentiment is nicely applicable to yeah, lots of areas of of life, touring cars, and just yeah, generally life overall. Did you know that their life is like a box of chocolates isn't actually the line? That it's life was like a box of chocolates. Did you know that? No. Yeah, they yeah, they never the said guys, life is like. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, good movie though. Great pick, great pick. Um, on to the final question. At Kids Love F1 YT on Twitter asks, well, I've kind of made it into a question because they kind of just said a statement. They said, ooh, Matt Neal was one of the touring car drivers in the Top Gear episodes where they raced motorhomes and airport machinery. So I want to ask you from that, what was it like to compete in those Top Gear events alongside the other BTCC drivers? And were the episodes really as they say, or was it mostly kind of set up? It was great TV. Yeah. You know, I, I just those three, they were they were genius and they're exactly like it off camera as they are on camera. Um yeah. it's very well choreographed, very well filmed. Um and you know, we we'd probably do a five or ten minute piece and you'd, you'd be filming a good over a day to do that. Um yeah. I remember once we were we were filming motorhome, we were, we were regular gonna race motorhome. And the story is you, you go and buy a motorhome and you trip it out, you sleep in it at night, and then you race it the next day. So we they deliver these motorhomes, they film the stripping them out a bit, uh, and then it'll look like we're hunkering down on them for the night. But for about, but after about three minutes, you all get up, go back to the hotel, and then come back the next morning, and you oh, we're waking up in these motorhomes and everything. So um, it did get a bit leery at certain points. Um, and uh, you know when you're racing the airport, you know we were racing airport equipment, and they thought it was hilarious that I was the biggest there. So they put me in the smallest little baggage handling thing uh, with trailers, on. and uh, they thought this was genius. And I just went, I just went, I'll, I'll go along with it. But that, even that was four tons a cart. Um, but then you got Matt, Matt Jackson was in a um, one of these things you tow airplanes with. And that thing coming at you was 38 tons. Like a double decker bus is only 10 tons. Oh um, 38 tons. So I, I was a bit twitchy there. If they hit you, it wasn't you weren't going to stop it. It was like a block of flats coming at you. But, um, yeah, we, did, we had some laughs. I'll tell you what, we cried a few times on it as well. We, we had some fun. Yeah, no, they looked just from watching in on the TV, they looked incredible. But I'm I, I'm gutted, honestly, that you didn't sleep in that caravan, mate. My life is a lie. Um, I can't believe you just enlightened me to that to that topic. But uh, <laughs> no, I did. I did kind of know that it was a bit fake, but it was fantastic to watch from uh, from afar. And yeah, just the crazy stuff they did. I don't think we'll ever see anyone do mental things like that again. But yeah, something definitely fun to be involved with at the time. But thank you very much for speaking with me today, Matt. Uh, you've given us some incredible insights into the world of BTCC and your life in general. So thank you very much for that. Just to finish, is there anything you'd like to say to any fans of yours who were uh, maybe out there watching this? Well, maybe as Arnold Schwarzenegger would say, I'll be back. So uh, <laughs> I'll leave on that note. But uh, yeah, just keep well and keep safe, everybody. And uh, I hope you have a great year ahead. Yeah, exactly. Fantastic. Yeah, but, yeah, just like Arnold Schwarzenegger, just like Arnold Schwarzenegger. But yeah, that's awesome. Thank you very much for uh, for watching or listening to another episode of the Chatterbox podcast. Guys, if you're on YouTube, you can like this video if you did enjoy it. And obviously subscribe to the Moto Meerkat channel so you stay up to date to any future episodes as well. Or if you're listening on a podcast hosting platform, be sure to follow us there too so you don't miss any of the future episodes. But otherwise, I've been Sir Meerkat and I will see all of you Meerkats later. Goodbye, guys. Thank you.